Welcome back. Uh, I hope you're still full of energy because there's a lot of material to come and I hope you will like it. Uh, there's some unconventional game theory material among it. And we'll start with pedestrians again. Um, and uh, we'll resume on coordination, but then uh, we talk about lane formation shortly and to continue with oscillations, which brings us eventually to traffic light control, uh, a very innovative approach, how to do that in these times. And if there's still enough time, we'll go back to sustainability as well. So you all have noticed this coordination problem that we see in many parts of the world. Uh, quite fascinating to watch, of course, uh, but the science behind it is even more interesting. And what you can find in many places of the world is actually self-organization of pedestrians. Even when you don't tell pedestrians what to do, they will sort out certain kinds of situations. In this case, you have counter flows that would obstruct each other unless they would actually form lanes in uniform walking direction this is exactly what they do you don't have to tell them how to do that there's no law no police enforcing that and most people are not even aware of that it just happens based on the interactions of pedestrians and this is quite fascinating and we can understand that actually based on game theory and i'll be introduced to you Last time, the coordination problem. So if two pedestrians have to avoid or evade each other, um, then basically that creates a repeated interaction setting, which eventually leads to lane formation, even if there's a 50-50 chance to go right or left. Plus, the, on top of all this, there is the formation of a behavioral convention over a longer period of time, which makes people <clears throat> prefer to walk on one side and that side could depend on the country, okay? Here is a computer simulation of a model. And you see it uh, starts pretty messy, but eventually you can see lanes and the number of lanes actually is going down over time. <clears throat> now we have, I would say three lanes and uh, after some time we probably see two lanes even. We assume that people who leave on one side are entering again on the other side. So in principle, it's a circular setting in our computer simulation. And all of that can be well understood based on a pretty simple model that is inspired by physics and it's called the social force model. It's based on two equations. It's an equation of motion, which just describes that the change of location in time of pedestrian alpha is given by the speed. And I think nobody would doubt that. The question then is how would the speed change in time, which is calling for an acceleration equation. And inspired by physics, um, I basically assume that there's a superposition of different forces representing different kinds of motivations. And one of them would be to accelerate towards the desired speed V alpha naught. Um, and the desired direction of motion, and that acceleration would take a certain time. It's called uh, typically uh, relaxation time or adaptation time. Further on, there would be interactions between pedestrian alpha and other pedestrians better, typically repulsive interactions, but not necessarily so. And there would be interactions with walls as well. And of course, some randomness that I haven't uh, shown explicitly over here. And here's a little illustration. Now, um, <clears throat> the interesting thing about um, the social force model is two things. First of all, it can actually produce various kinds of self-organized 
collective patterns of motion that you would also find in reality. On the other hand, um, the social force model can be derived from the theory of differential games, which has been done by a colleague of mine, Sir Toby Dorn. And one of my first publications is actually this one. And it has not only looked into the lane formation phenomenon, which we wanted to understand, but also we found at bottlenecks another kind of collective pattern of motion that is self-organized, which is actually oscillatory flows. So the bottleneck is a bit hard to see, but it's here and uh, there's basically a door and you can see that for some time, um, those particles uh, down in yellow would pass the door and then the particles in red, those particles uh, would symbolize uh, pedestrians wanting to walk in different directions. And again, we don't program the oscillations to occur. There is no law that forces them to do that. There is no traffic light, no police. It's just the interactions between those pedestrians who want to move forward according to this social force model. And so basically uh, one side uh, can pass the door, on the other side, pressure builds up, that pressure will stop the flow, the tide will turn, so pedestrians will walk into the other direction and this is how it goes back and forth basically. We'll see that this can be used also as a design principle. I understand it's sometimes hard to believe that nature would just create wonderful things based on self-organization. But that's one of the most fascinating things in this world altogether, right? Our life is based on self-organization. Our brain's functioning is work, uh, based on self-organization. Ecosystems, all of that is based on self-organization. Our immune system, you know, there's no giant supercomputer that controls it all. So that's the magic of nature, I would say, that we found ways that would make things happen that are often desirable. <clears throat> and in order to understand that, we need to understand a bit more about complex systems or complex dynamical systems. And we need to distinguish here between complex and complicated systems. Because a car is a complicated system and it's made up of a lot of components, but it's still well controllable. That's how it's designed. Otherwise, you would not drive a car. It was not reasonably well controllable. While if many cars interact with each other on the street, it turns out that uh, things get often uncontrollable. Um, at least to some extent, uncontrollable in the sense that there's a traffic jam that forms and nobody wanted this to happen. So why then did it happen? And it's an interaction effect, basically. Now, complex systems or complex dynamical systems are important to know about because they're all around us. There are a lot of these systems, financial markets, our economy, um, social systems, society altogether, no matter whether it's a democracy or some other system, there's a lot of self-organization going on. And those systems are characterized by a large number of interacting system elements and uh, typically nonlinear or network interactions or both. And that would create a rich system behavior in the sense that different kinds of things can happen. And it depends on parameters what will happen. And that makes it so interesting to study those systems because you would want to find out, you know, what is it that determines that we find this behavior or that behavior? <clears throat> those uh, systems, complex systems, would often behave dynamic rather than static, uh, probabilistic rather than deterministic, and they're often surprising, often even 
paradoxical system behaviors such as slower is faster effects, no systems are how to predictable, seemingly uncontrollable, that means nightmares for politicians and managers who don't know about complex systems. A good example for limits of predictability is actually weather forecasting and has become a lot better, but um, physicists would agree that even if you had a thousand times more data or a million times or a trillion times more data, you could never make an exact prediction forever or just over a year's time. And why is that? Because um, there is the phenomenon of turbulence behind some of those weather phenomena and physicists have studied turbulence for a long time. And here, little changes can make a big difference over a long enough period of time. Which means that changes that are so small that you cannot even measure them could be the tenth digit after the comma, um, they could play a role later on for whether you find nice weather or you uh, would find a thunderstorm. That again is hard to imagine, but uh, there are tons of scientists who have looked into this and it's an established fact. And so given this, perhaps we should not uh, be any more that surprised that there's also often the illusion of control. So this is not a very difficult task to drive in a circle at a, a steady speed and avoid accidents. Um, but you see everyone fails. Even though everyone is well educated as a driver's license, uh, a new car, a good visibility, the best intentions to avoid a traffic jam and it happens because of a phenomenon called systemic instability. Above a certain critical density, what happens is that small variations will actually amplify. The next car will break with a little delay. There's a reaction time. And in order to compensate for that, there will be an overreaction. And that amplifies that little change. And there will be a chain reaction that eventually produces that traffic jam. We can understand it still, you know, there is some mathematics and the science of this. Um, and we do understand what are conditions that would make systems systemically unstable and thereby uncontrollable by individuals. Okay. And now things get even more complicated if people interact not just in a circle or in a line, but in a network. And in fact, we are used to look at social systems as a collection of people and everyone has certain kind of um, properties like a character, you know, a personality. And so we would think the social system altogether would be the sum of all those characters involved in that social system and it turns to be uh, it turns out to be terribly raw because when people interact with each other people will start influencing each other and uh, perhaps um, you know try to pressure other people uh, which they shouldn't do or convince people to change their mind and to uh, do something else and so interaction effects will change behaviors. And the more interactions and the stronger those interactions, the more is the system behavior determined by the network interactions rather than the properties of the individual system components, which are uh, the people, okay? And this is what complex complexity science is interested in to understand what is the impact, the effect of network interactions, particularly nonlinear interactions. And in fact, what you then get is typically not the intended effect, 
say you're a manager of a company or even a president or chancellor of a country and you want to do this and then something else happens and everyone is upset but it's because it's a complex dynamical system so if, we, if you don't know how complex dynamical systems behave and respond to influences then uh, we'll never be able to get it right because there are side effects, there are feedback effects, and there are cascading effects, okay? Those can be undesirable effects, but if you know about them, you could also use them for good. So self-organization is not necessarily a bad thing. Just face the fact that complex dynamical systems tend to self-organize, and the outcome Interestingly enough, is often resilient to reasonably small or even reasonably big perturbations. And establishing suitable interactions will produce a desirable outcome by itself based on self organization. So you don't have to force it. You have the right kind of interactions. This will make certain kinds of things happen. Uh, in fact, those things that would be desirable given the right kinds of interactions. So basically you need to figure out what kind of interactions do I need? So the outcome would automatically be a favorable one. And this is the area of a field of game theory that's called mechanism design. What is the mechanism that I need so the system would do what I hope it would do, okay? And we've done that. So take the example of that uh, stop and go traffic uh, that we have looked into before. We can simulate it in the computer as you see over here. It's not that complicated. It's kind of more, uh, the 3D thing is the most <laughs> complicated thing at that time. Now we of course have ready-made uh, software products for that, but uh, this was done quite a few years ago. And, and then the question was, can we dissolve the traffic jams? And do we need a traffic control center that controls every single car's motion or not? And we haven't done that. We have assumed that cars, in fact, the certain center cars would be equipped with certain uh, traffic assistance technology. They would be able to measure, say, with a laser sensor or radar sensor, distances and relative velocities. And based on that, cars would automatically accelerate or decelerate in a slightly different way from what drivers would do, and you can see traffic jam dissolves, even though we have the same inflow of cars, same traffic conditions, but given the other kinds of interactions, the system can handle it. And rather than traffic jams, we get free traffic flow. And the only thing it takes is basically real-time measurement and real-time feedback to change the interaction just a little bit between the cars. It does not need a traffic control center to control every single car. And it even works if, um, say, 30 or 40% of cars are equipped with that technology and all the other cars are still kind of dumb cars that you know don't sense their environment and don't respond uh, in a special way. Amazing, you know, but uh, Silicon Valley knows very little about that. That's also amazing. And now Zurich knows about that and that could make a difference, right? Now, a further um, interesting things about urban traffic is that assuming that people are behaving in a selfish way, and uh, choose the shortest route that could produce uh, traffic jams that uh, would be avoidable. And um, in particular, there is a paradox which is called Brand's paradox, where you add a road, this road over here, you have two alternative uh, connections from an origin to a destination. But then you add a further road, which gives you more possibilities to get from N to T. Um, and it turns out it will slow down traffic. So taking out that road will improve the traffic situation. How is this possible? 
And so there's a framework that people call the price of anarchy. In this case, uh, just everyone does, does what they like. In this case, kind of uh, selfishly uh, choose the shortest route. Um, then the system um, outcome will often not be the optimal outcome. And you can compare the two, like what you get as compared to what the optimal outcome would be. And that's the price of anarchy, okay? According to definition. So selfishness has a price, uh, basically. And um, of course, politicians say we'd like to have the optimal systemic outcome or social outcome, okay? And, um, and then again, you know, there are people who, who say, okay, then that's just force everyone to take a certain route, basically to uh, impose the optimum on the system. But then, you know, freedom and democracy are gone. And the question is, uh, is that needed? Or is it just a business model that kills democracy, you know? <laughs> to be a little bit, demo uh, a little bit um, um, provocative about that. And so we have a PhD student looking into these kind of question. Um, and he's been simulating that in a computer and has been looking into learning dynamics. In particular, he's also been looking into irrational agents. That means the divers would not necessarily take the shortest route, but um, there would be some noise, for example, and sometimes people would do something that is not in accordance with the, the best individual choice, the selfish choice. And it turns out that can improve the overall situation. That means noise can be good. So from the point of view of the system, a less rational behavior can be smarter. And that also raises the question now, is rational behavior um, a desirable, even, even a reasonable, <laughs> from a systemic point of view, uh, behavior? No? This really raises very fundamental questions. And we'll find out later on, people actually, in many cases, don't behave in a rational way. They're not that selfish. And perhaps it's because that deviation from selfishness and rationality uh, actually produces better systemic outcome that, no, on average, we benefit from. Perhaps being rational is not always being smart. Okay. Then, um, in, in fact, people have said, you know, oh, that's why don't we make experiments and just close down roads in real cities? And, uh, and, and in fact, Manhattan, for example, has done that. Uh, 42nd Street uh, was closed down. It's perhaps not that much of a surprise because Manhattan is pretty much uh, a square road based system to a large part. And then there was a diagonal road cutting through this and disturbing kind of the regularity of uh, that system. And so closing that road down was actually beneficial and it's now a pedestrian zone uh, in some parts. So a lot of people have benefited from that, uh, not only pedestrians, but also uh, drivers. Um, and so, yeah, let's close down roads. But let's do it in a smart way, okay? And uh, in order to do that, we have looked into another city, which also has quite a lot of square road infrastructure, which is Barcelona, a city that probably many of you know. I like it quite a lot, an uh, interesting city. And there are really fierce political discussions about uh, how to change that system uh, to make it um, you know more sustainable but on the other hand also to uh, provide more space for other modes of transport than cars like 
bikes, pedestrians, and so on. And they have discussed a super blocks model where they basically closed down some of those roads. And uh, they didn't have um, a computer simulation that we were able to establish. So one other PhD student in my team has been working out a digital twin of Barcelona's traffic. So he can simulate traffic flow throughout that city quite realistically. And has been calibrated with empirical data. So we're quite confident that uh, what the simulation says is meaningful. It's not perfect, but it's meaningful. And um, then we can look into all sorts of uh, scenarios where we actually look at what happens if we close down this road or that road or that many roads. Um, and in fact, there is a publication about that we can look into. And um, it looks really into different kinds of scenarios. You can see it over here, uh, the overall view of the city and then some of the parts magnified. And what is shown in green are those roads that would be closed down. So which one, which scenario should we implement? Well, as uh, scientists, we are neutral. We are doing the simulation. We are evaluating it, and then we get results. And uh, the interesting point is that, yeah, uh, depending on the scenario, there's quite some difference. And interestingly enough, we can have positive um, environmental impact and at the same time, even improve traffic flow. That means improving sustainability and uh, making something good for uh, the environment does not always have to be painful for people. But we do it in a smart way, right? And uh, digital technology can help us to figure out what are the smart ways of uh, doing things, you know, where we can have good functionality for us and uh, a good service to nature as well. So typically there's no one size fits all solution that's most effective and best for you know, every city. So what, what I would consider, uh, that was my job uh, to look at mobility and urban planning, then I would probably combine different approaches, you know, like, um, closing down some roads that are just disturbing um, the overall harmony in a sense. Um, I, I would probably also add incentive systems and I would do what I'm going to talk about next, uh, which is implement self organizing traffic lights. And in fact, in many cities, you know, uh, even though, of course, every city wants to, to get rid of traffic jams, I guess uh, it often ends up like this. You now, horror, monster traffic jams, uh, completely blocked roads in the worst case. And it wouldn't have that uh, to be that way. So here is a movie that I really like to show. I've uh, recorded it quite a few years ago in Egypt, uh, close by to the pyramids of Giza. And uh, as you see over here, this is self-organizing traffic with very diverse traffic participants. Now cars, trucks, buses, uh, pedestrians, uh, people with cars, uh, uh, donkeys, camels, horses, uh, <laughs> yeah. extreme diversity, um, and it works. Now, why does it work? Um, it's because of the design of that intersection. We have unidirectional flow in the front. We have opposite unidirectional flow in the back. And importantly, we have a buffer in the middle that allows everyone to adjust the speed 
in such a way that you would have a gap when you want to cross. <clears throat> and that works. So um, there are no traffic lights here, no police. Um, it's self-organizing. And so, of course, what I am not showing you here is that there's a lot of honking too, and uh, we don't want this noise, right? But on the other hand, we are now entering <clears throat> this digital age. Uh, we are in the middle of it, I would say, and there's Internet of Things technology that can do similar things um, in a way that does not produce a lot of noise. And so why don't we do that? So, in fact, our approach has been inspired by, by pedestrians at bottlenecks, where we found those self-organizing oscillations. And we were wondering, couldn't we basically treat intersections like multidimensional bottlenecks in a sense? Bottlenecks for many crossing flows. Um, and couldn't we have a principle that produces self-organizing oscillations and then use that to define the traffic lights? And we have the traffic flows control the traffic lights rather than the other way around. And how well would that work? Perhaps some people would uh, uh, think that's a crazy idea, but let's look into this, okay? In fact, it's possible to define a pressure principle that would uh, create self-organized oscillations. And as you can see over here in this uh, Manhattan kind of network, there are also green waves that self-organize. And there's some coordination uh, between intersections going on as well. And this is what we actually like to have, right? So our approach then basically measures outflows from road sections, but it also measures inflows. And that's being used uh, for very short time predictions of vehicle arrivals that we can anticipate how many cars would be in the queue and how much time it would take to clear the queue if we had a green light, okay? Now, what we have compared is basically three approaches. The classical approach is based on a traffic control center, and that's uh, trying to collect as much data as possible and then to come up with an optimal control scheme and then impose it on the city and basically control all the traffic lights you have a powerful enough center okay and um, that's kind of the paradigm of the bailiff volant dictator and tries to coordinate different intersections into them. then there is a second approach uh, which is based on the idea of homo economicus i mean every intersection separately from each other strictly optimizes traffic flow in the neighborhood only, in the neighboring um, road sections. There's travel time minimization, uh, even formulas, uh, mathematical formulas that allow you to solve that explicitly in some cases. But there's no coordination. Now, it, no intersection cares about any other intersections. Everyone just wants to do the best job. Okay? For themselves. And then the third approach is like the second, but um, if there are large queues, we would first clear those queues before we go back to uh, travel time minimization. That means we deviate from the optimization principle for some time. This is good for neighboring intersection. That's why we call it other regarding. It avoids spillover effects, it's friendly in a sense uh, towards others, but you know, how well would those intersections then perform themselves? Right, so kind of conventional wisdom would say, that's obviously the best, that's the second best, and that's the worst. There's just an issue that there are quite a lot of parameters that you can vary in traffic light control. You know, which order of traffic lights, which 
lengths of green light uh, which offset between two different intersections and so on. So there's hundreds, uh, if not thousands of parameters you can vary and all of those parameters can com combine with each other. So there is combinatorial explosion of possibilities and there's so many possibilities you cannot even go through them all with a supercomputer. It's an NP hard optimization problem. So you need to make simplifications and typically you try to come up with an optimal traffic control offline for a typical traffic situation Monday morning between 10 and 11, say Friday afternoon between three and four. And, and so basically you take it out of the folder and then you adapt screen times a little bit based on measurements, but you don't change the order of traffic lights anymore. Right? That's basically how you would do it. But then it turns out that there is no typical traffic flow. You know, there's no Monday morning between 10 and 11 identical. There's always quite a lot of variability. And so you have an optimal control scheme for a traffic situation that never occurs for an average traffic situation at that time. And so it's not optimal. And we have um, compared that, as I said before, with an approach that adapts to the actual traffic situation in the neighborhood. And the question is, how well would that be? In fact, it turns out um, the top down regulation produces the red curve as a function of capacity utilization. That means traffic volume queues increase with more traffic volume. That's what we expect. Then the uh, homo economic approach, the selfish optimization would be um, this line over here. So it starts better because it gives the green light to every incoming car whenever it arrives at the intersection. And then eventually there are more cars coming at the same time and we cannot give a green light to, uh, automatically to the next car. And so eventually, Q-Links explodes and the self sensation breaks down in a sense at that traffic volume. And this, you know, is not a good reason for a traffic control center. But the third approach turns out to be better all the way. The other regarding approach. Our approach does not assume periodicity at all. You know, the question is just are non-periodic solutions potentially highly performing, or are they so bad we don't even need to consider that? Okay, so um, it, our results suggested at the time that uh, bottom-up self-organization could actually have benefits. And then we went to the traffic control center in Dresden and said, shouldn't we do a project together? And they said, well, you know, we just bought a new state-of-the-art system. I think it was a few millions that it costs, and it, it produces green waves, and uh, it's adaptive. Um, uh, there's just one thing that we'd like to do and couldn't do with that system because it would basically interrupt the green waves, and that would cause traffic jams that would quickly spread and produce a monster traffic jam, so we don't interrupt the green waves. But actually, we would like to prioritize public transportation. So if you think you're smart, you know, come up with a solution that does green waves and prioritizes public transportation. And it's really challenging because, first of all, it's not a regular street network. Second of all, there's a lot of buses and trams cutting through this area in different ways. Uh, so it's really a nightmare for a transportation planner. But anyway, we, we did it. Uh, we uh, simulated it with the uh, measurement data that they gave us, which was also the basis of the calibration of the state-of-the-art control that they used. And you can see state-of-the-art control really poses periodic uh, green waves with some adaptability. Okay. Our flexible self-control approach uh, also produces green waves, but they're not as pronounced. 
That could be a good or a bad thing. We don't know yet. We just see the difference. And then the numbers, however, show that uh, we could dramatically improve this situation for public transport by prioritization, but cars would not have to suffer for that. They would even also have a little improvement. And also the distance with scientists and nature by the way as well. So kind of everyone would benefit from that flexibility, that adaptation to the actual needs locally. And then what happens is the following. My previous PhD student did that uh, thesis with Stefan Lemmer and established a company together with uh, the person who previously ran the traffic control center of Zurich, Christian Heimgartner. And they together established a company and then uh, they were testing this some organization or self-control approach in the city of Lucerne. And of course, the city made measurements beforehand to know how well the system performed then. And after the implementation of the new traffic light control, they also made measurements afterwards and they had an independent evaluation by a professorship of ETH. They did not even tell me about it. I had no influence on it. So it was a neutral evaluation. You can see it was a large improvement, really. The red areas, which amounts to kind of the waiting times, were reduced quite a lot. As compared to a system that they tried to optimize before by themselves or through a company. Okay. So improvements for everyone, in fact. And so there was a um, news article that said uh, more green for everyone, which sounds like an impossibility, but it just means that we didn't waste or they didn't waste um, as much green time at times it was needed. So it was a better coordination, basically. Okay. And um, it's an approach that can be contributing to climate friendly traffic control, but we would have to say goodbye to this idea that we can control and optimize everything in a top down way, even in complex analytical systems. So I'd like to go back to sustainability, okay? And part of um, sustainability is, of course, to make better use of the resources that we have. And when it comes to food, um, then there's a lot of food wasted. And it's partly because food has um, limited durability. So we need to get it to the consumer quickly. It's a, a race against time. And there's books about that. But um, supply networks is another challenge that we could look at from the point of view of complex dynamical systems. And actually there's some analogies between traffic and production networks and they're listed over here. I'm not sure I should really go through all of these points, but here is a newspaper article, how chip producers can learn from pedestrians. And in fact, uh, we were working together with uh, Infineon Technologies at that time in Dresden, and we applied an effect is called slower is faster effect. I don't need to mention that, of course, they did everything to improve the performance of their machine by themselves. They had trained engineers who studied that for many years, but looked at the system from the way that learned to look at the system. And we learned, uh, looked at the system in a different way. And it's about um, this setup. It's a so-called back bench, um, and it, it produces uh, wafers with uh, silicon chips, silicium chips. All right, 
And uh, those are the silicon vapors that been exposed to, to um, light, so a, a very intense light that basically carves out certain structures. And then you have to put it into chemical bases to take out some materials, then wash it because there's another chemical to follow and wash it and so on. And there is a dripper basically has to move around those um, silicon vapors. And, uh, and now we do that. Okay, first uh, set of vapors are being put in there. Chemical process in the meantime, um, it has been processed, it goes into the water. Um, next chemical, now we can put in uh, the next set of vapors and so on and so on. So it's not that complicated actually, oh, sorry. And they wanted to have more throughput, which means like they wanted to process um, the vapors shorter. So they can put through more vapors in the same period of time. And he said, that's not a good idea. Why not? Because if you do that, it could happen that two sets of vapors want to be moved on at the same time. That cannot be done. One of them has to wait, perhaps so long that it goes longer than the maximum treatment times you have to throw away those vapors. We just recommended the opposite. Increase the treatment time. So that one, Gripper would not be uh, getting into so many conflicts of interest and moving around several um, sets of papers at the same time. And see what happened. We had an increase of the throughput by more than 30%. And they implemented, they were very happy. We got nothing, but they uh, saved a lot of money, uh, millions, in fact. Um, and so what I want to say is basically um, using paradoxical principles in self-organizing uh, complex dynamical systems can allow you to improve system performance a lot. Just need to understand complex dynamical systems better. And then the question is, what does that mean really for making the world more sustainable? I do think that we should build on self-organization a lot more because those systems are complex dynamical systems. I do fully agree that we should turn wasteful supply chains into a circular economy. And everyone says that, the question is just how to do that. We can make a lot of loss, but if nobody has an idea really how to make it happen, then um, it just doesn't happen. Now, rather than suggesting to have more laws enforcing this, enforcing that, we said, you know, why not empower the system to be better at self-organizing itself? And for this, we need to give real-time information. And that can be provided now with Internet of Things technology, the little sensors that can be connected to the internet, you can measure basically everything pretty cheaply, and thereby um, come up with also the data about the system. But as compared to many others who say, you know, let's build a control center for this. We say, let's do it in a participatory way um, based on self organization And so we even suggested um, Internet of Things network uh, built and run by the citizen who was called NervousNet at the time. And the idea was that we could all contribute to measuring environmental impacts, noise, CO2, all sorts of externalities, materials that can be recycled and reused, and all sorts of good things, also cultural, educational, whatever things they'd like to have more. And now come the incentive systems. So uh, we'd like to have more positive externalities, 
less negative ones and a fair compensation. And what we've done is inspired by how nature works, you, we have proposed to build a new monitor system. And I should say, how does nature work? I mean, the good news is we do know that it's possible to build a circular supply network, a circular economy. We, why do we know that? Well, nature is such a system. Everything is being reused. And it's the outcome of millions of years of evolution, but it's not forbidden to look how nature does it, right? And to learn from that. Now, interestingly enough, nature does not have a super duper computer that collects all the data about everything that happens in the world, uh, in all those ecosystems out there, and then tries to optimize things, then impose one kind of organization on the entire system. No. It doesn't work that way. It's much simpler and much more effective. It has local real-time feedbacks. It does not store data forever even. Local temporary real-time feedbacks, that's it. All you need. But not just one kind of feedback, right? I think... Um, if you want to tax every kind of unwanted externality in say dollars or euros or so, it's not going to do a good job. Because if you want to use one control variable to control a thousand different things, now how should that work really? So we need to have several different kinds of feedback loops. So what we propose is basically uh, to define different sorts of money that are based on different kinds of measurements. That could be CO2 measurements, noise measurements, measurements of how much glass or plastic or steel or whatever is uh, available where. And uh, so each measurement procedure basically defines a new kind of money. And at that time, we suggested we could, for example, combine measurements uh, of Internet of Things sensors with blockchain technology. It does not necessarily have to be done this way. But anyway, the idea is to introduce new forces in this way into the market that would change the system little by little in a co-evolutionary way. Everyone would try to improve production, consumption, you know, a little based on the circumstances that they find around them. And they would also respond to that little improvement and everyone would keep improving. And that would um, produce a circular system over time as a result of a co-evolutionary process. Now, while multidimensional is really a paradigm change, it goes beyond optimization. Optimization uh, sounds great, but not only do we have this NP-hard optimization problems that we cannot solve in real time, also optimization based on the one-dimensional goal function. Because you want to compare two solutions, and then you want to know this is better, this is worse, so you want to have a larger or smaller operation that requires one dimension out. So, Mapping a problem in a complex system like the problems of the world in a one-dimensional goal function is a terrible oversimplification. So optimization will not deliver you the system that you really want to live in. It's perhaps part of the solution in some places, but it's not the general solution for everything. And in fact, this is what you get if you optimize. And that's a typical supply network today. It's pretty linear, hierarchical. It's made for control and controllability. Now, how do systems look like in nature? Very different. Our metabolism, material flows in our body, you know, that's... Uh, also a supply network. And this is what, how 
it looks like. There are lots of circles, which we'd like to have, right? But if you have a circle, then the question is, does this control that, or does that control that, or do they control each other, or do they influence each other? You know, it's, it's not a hierarchical control system. Once we have cycles, hierarchical control is gone. It's not compatible with hierarchical control. And that's, that means as long as you try to hierarchically control supply network will not get a circular economy. That's my interpretation. I may be wrong, but uh, now why don't we have a circular economy yet, despite all that supercomputers and all the data and all the AI systems in the world? It's a shame. Obviously, we are on the wrong track. OK. So we need to change our minds. So also, I'd like to stress that ecological systems and also a circular economy is not a zero-sum game. We often suggested that, oh, there are limited resources and, you know, um, what I have, nobody else can have. And so, you know, it's basically a, a battle for resources. And then, of course, what the outcome is war, not a circular economy. Um, uh, we need to change that thinking, too, because, you know, a thing that I have, but I don't need now, somebody else could use. And it's not a damage to me. Just makes a lot more sense to do it this way. Why do cars stand in the way 90% of their time? You know, it doesn't have to be this way. So rather than a zero-sum game, we should uh, learn how to build symbiotic system. And uh, biology has many examples to learn from. Now back to game theory, OK? So we started with environmental exploitation, environmental pollution, overfishing, climate change, and all this. and. And often it said, these are the outcomes of tragedies of the commons, and it's because people are selfish. And that's why we cannot allow people to take their own free decisions. Uh, we now, if we want to save the planet, we now need to control what everyone does. Is that true? Who thinks that's true? No, nobody dares anymore to <laughs> raise your hand, but you know. <laughs> I've read that many times in the news. What, what if uh, people would take different decisions if they had more information about the impact of taking this route or that route in terms of how much Delays would that cause? How much congestion would that cause? How much CO2 would that emit? You know, how bad would it be for the environment? Um, wouldn't that change possibly the uh, behavior of people? And now, uh, wouldn't it be worth trying? So is, perhaps this is more a problem of not giving people the information they need then a problem that people are so selfish that it's beyond repair and that's why we need to force everyone. The question is, are humans really selfish payoff maximizers as often claimed and assumed by the concept of homo economicus originally? And then experimental game theory came. And um, before, you know, basically uh, people saw, we don't even need to make experiments because we know people are selfish and now we can calculate the implications of that by, by means of mathematics. And then somebody started doing experiments such as um, the ultimatum game. And here, perhaps you've learned that already, and uh, I'll just summarize it shortly. An experimenter gives some money to a person one player one and that player can pass on part of that money to player two and if player two accepts that amount of money then basically uh, that amount of money stays with player two and the remainder stays with player one 
but player two can turn down the offer. In that case, nobody gets anything. So it's kind of a punishment for kind of being not generous enough in, in terms of sharing. And there's a uh, even simpler version that's called the dictator game where the experimenter gives some money to player one and player one can take give any part of that money to player two or not, everything. Um, and player two cannot punish or do anything. Everything is determined by player one. The question is what happens? It's pretty clear that um, the theory of selfish behavior predicts that player one would give a minimum amount in both games to player two. And then if you do experiments, that often doesn't happen. And it's really puzzling, you know? Uh, in fact, um, people do um, often give about say 40% uh, of the amount to the in, in the ultimating game and a, uh, a bit less in the dictator game. And what we did then is, you know, we, we couldn't believe it ourselves. And some people have said, you know, this is because people are meeting each other in a room and perhaps they know each other or they think, oh, perhaps I meet that person again. So perhaps it's a better idea to be a bit friendly to that person. So. <laughs> Next time I meet that person, that person is not upset about me. So we were wondering, what if the interaction was anonymous? And we had uh, different uh, degrees of anonymity. And in, in some settings, it was really ensured that the people in that game, the players one and two, would know they would never meet that other person. They would never know who the other person was. And uh, so we came up with a special payment approach that um, where they did not have to reveal their name even to the uh, person who paid out the money. So they basically got a certain uh, number uh, a code that allowed them to to get uh, money by presenting that code. They never had to say, "I am person X." Right. We also did not need those those people. That was an independent payment institution. All right, and looking into the data more closely, it turns out there are actually different kinds or types of uh, people, and some are more selfish and oriented and others are more fairness oriented. So people are not the same. <clears throat> anyway, so people are not, most of them at least, are not uh, totally selfish. Uh, to some extent, yes, and some are, but uh, most people have some degree of non-selfishness um, in many cases. And, and then basically economists said, oh, I will fix that. And basically this is because individuals maximize utilities and not payoffs. You know, perhaps they enjoy being nice to other people and we should put that joy also into the utility function. Um, but then if everyone has a different utility function, uh, how to empirically determine the utility function for everyone, so we can make predictions. And a theory that's not predictive uh, would not be very powerful. And a theory to predict the individual utilities, I would say is largely missing. And uh, the question is, what do we do then? It would be great to develop a theory explaining individual preference and utilities. Um, and we've done that in a computer simulation. And so I, I was really curious myself. Is it true that people as a 
outcome of evolution would be selfish, which has been always a foundational assumption in ma many parts of economics. And so I said, yeah, let's check it out in the computer. You know? Let's just simulate evolution. And that's what we did in that paper over here. And there are four rules, basically. So agents decide according to a best response rule that strictly maximizes their utility function, giving the behaviors of their interaction partners, which in that case were their neighbors in a 2D setting, okay? Then we assume that the utility function considers not only the own payoff, but also gives a certain weight to the payoff of the interaction partners the way we call the friendliness, but it was set to zero in the beginning. So everyone was totally unfriendly, did not care at all about the payoff of other people, just cared about their own payoff. That was the initial situation. So people started totally selfish. Then we had um, two additional rules. So friendliness uh, was assumed to be a trait that is inherited uh, genetically or by education to offspring. And the likelihood to have offspring would increase exclusively with the own payoff because you would have to pay for the food, education, everything, you know. Um, so the friendliness, and cannot pay something for friendliness towards other people. Um, so payoff was really the basis for having offspring and payoff is assumed to be zero when a friendly agent is exploited by all neighbors. That means they all defect. And so as such uh, super friendly agents would never have any offspring because they could not afford uh, to basically uh, pay for their offspring and uh, feed them and educate them. So. And then on top, we have um, assumed some mutation rate of the friendliness, similar to what uh, evolution biologists would assume, but uh, we would make sure that it would not produce uh, automatically after some time, say a uh, friendliness of 50%, because then there's no surprise. Okay, so then what did you find? Well, economists were right in this area over here. So Homo economicus resulted to stay there forever but, interestingly enough, there was a little corner where homo sexualis resulted. I mean, uh, people with other regarding preferences, not just cooperative behavior, but other regarding preferences. And they would basically cooperate if a sufficient number of their neighbors would be cooperative. So it's kind of traditional cooperation that results from that process that I just described. And, and I should say, you know, this happens when offspring are born and live in a neighboring location of parents. But hey, that's actually what people do. You know, most of the time, that's that's the fact of life. And actually, what was kind of uh, special about humans is that offspring stay a long time with their parents. Um, so that could be really uh, important for making us social. But that process that would make people social was really simplified a lot. So we, we had very simple, strict assumptions on uh, how that could happen. So, and, and it turns out that uh, evolution um, makes many people other regarding. And in fact, it takes many generations, it can take dozens of generations until Friendliness and cooperation go up, and in the beginning, in fact, cooperative people would suffer because they would get much less payoff on average than um, selfish uh, people, unfriendly people. But then, over after many generations, that would eventually change. 
the people would get a little bit friendly and they would still behave in a non-cooperative way. But if there are enough cooperative neighbors, they would also switch to be cooperative. So a cascading effect can result if uh, a person is born with uh, who is super friendly and always cooperates, no matter what. In the beginning, network cannot make a difference. Will just be exploited, you know, will be painful. But here, when there's some level of friendliness and some conditional cooperativeness among people, then such a person can make all the difference and spread in a cascading effect cooperation throughout the system. And as a result of that process, uh, even though everyone is unfriendly at the beginning, which you can see in this plot. After some time, we have a broad distribution of friendliness values in the population. Not everyone is the same. It's around 0.4, I would say. And let's look into an experimental result that the colleague has uh, found together with his team. And in fact, what they find is, yes, there are some individualistic people who are selfish. They do exist. But most people have some degree of gross partiality. I mean, uh, they are out of regarding to some extent. Yeah, I'm about to finish. And um, that, that means um, what the simulation predicted is actually well compatible with experimental results. And even famous Adam Smith uh, knew that. Just uh, many economists didn't want uh, to remember that for some time. And here's a quote that I uh, made centrally neutral. So, however selfish humans may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in their nature which interest them in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to them, though they derive nothing from it. That was from 1759. Okay. So what I want to say is basically, you know, um, yes, homo economicus is a possible outcome of an evolutionary process depending on circumstances, but homo sociales can also be solved. Homo sociales is not just a little deviation, like uh, you know, doing some mistakes sometimes and being not perfectly rational. Not a little variation of homo economicus, but it's really something different based on caring about others, based on interaction with others. Um, and so statistical independence cannot be assumed in decision making. Rather, we need to consider the interaction effects. And that's why I was calling some time ago for a new kind of economic theory, economic 2.0, which would basically consider that people are not perfectly selfish, but many of them are to some extent other regard. And there's a paper that looks into this idea. And of course, um, Eleanor Ostrom also pointed us into this direction. She got a Nobel Prize uh, by showing that proper design principles would allow self-organization to work in society. Self-governance could be effective. She made experiments, interesting enough, in Switzerland. So that was the uh, basis of, I think, uh, her Nobel Prize. And there are eight rules that she derived that would be essential in order to allow self-governance to work well. And depending on circumstances, one could uh, probably adjust those principles. But in principle, there are many decentralized approaches that can help to produce cooperative outcomes in situations where otherwise um, cooperation would not be expected, like in social dilemma situations. Among those mechanisms are reputation mechanisms. I'd also like to mention one mechanism that famous Heinrich Nux uh, has proposed, and this is based on marriage-based matching. That means, uh, more cooperative people would be preferentially matched with other more cooperative people that altogether creates 
a trend towards more cooperation. I mean, it will lift up the system eventually towards higher levels of cooperation. I think that's quite interesting. Also, competition about uh, between mechanisms can be interesting to look at. And for those who thought punishment will do it, it turns out it's not the most effective mechanism to make the world work. Altruistic signaling is more effective among those five mechanisms that we looked at. And so in conclusion, we could say, we don't need punishment. We don't need centralized control to make systems work and to get the levels of cooperation uh, and coordination that we need for systems to thrive. Game theory can help. Digital assistants can help using data about the environment, allowing for adaptation. Those systems would also potentially support collective intelligence, kind of the essential swarm intelligence to people. Also, this idea is pretty old. Like uh, the fable of the bees is from 1714. And the idea was, you know, couldn't society work in a similar way? Of course, people are more complicated um, and you cannot just transfer everything from bees to people, but some things can be learned actually from bees. And in particular, if you want uh, to bring the best ideas of many minds together, which uh, should be, I think, the basis of digital democracies, um, then one can learn from the steps that are needed to allow this to happen. And in fact, uh, first phase should be an exploration phase, like with the bees, not influenced by anybody. Independent search, high diversity of solution approaches, and then only in a second phase uh, would there be information exchange between those who have come up uh, with ideas for solutions. And then in a deliberative phase, uh, integrated solutions would be created. And then after that, one would vote on the best solution, okay? So interestingly enough, in these collective intelligence approaches, diversity wins, not the best. The combination of solutions can be better than the best expert solution. So combining the best solution with a second best, a third best solution does not necessarily make it worse. It can actually improve the solution. That's the surprising thing. And we could build incentive systems to promote collective intelligence and promote better societies, digital democracies that would be more powerful than what we have today. With this, I'm at the end of my lecture. I hope you found it inspiring. And I hope you would follow up and read a little bit in this direction. If you're interested, there's a book um, which brings together many of the things, in particular in the second part, which explains how self-organization could be used as a new approach for future societies.